Good evening, and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Henrietta Toivonen, and I'm one of the Ad Fellows this year. The global energy market is connected to our lives, both at the macro and micro level. Energy is the fundamental dr driver of our modern society, enabling us to live in large metropolitan communities and allowing us to use everything from our cell phones and laptops to our cars and home appliances. Tonight, we will focus on, the, on recent developments, pressing challenges, and international pressures in the world energy markets and di discuss the domestic and geopolitical impacts on economics and security. Our speaker, Spencer Abraham, served at the 10th U.S. Secretary of Energy from 2001 to 2005. Under his leadership, the department made major advances in the development of new energy technologies, successfully implemented a variety of nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear security programs, and launched initiatives to improve the nation's energy security. Prior to his role, he served as um, at, in the U.S. Senate um, and served as well as, um, as the Deputy Chief of Staff in the Office of the P Vice President um, and as the Co-Chairman of the Na National Republican Congressional, Congressional Committee. Um, after leaving his position um, in the government, he has launched his own international energy consulting business and serves on the boards of a number of, of public and private corporations. Mr. Abraham is, featured, is the featured parent speaker for Parents Weekend um, this year. And as always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Abraham to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much, Henrietta. You know, one of the nice things about the way the Athenaeum program works is that you actually get to sit with students and you meet the person introducing you. And I want to thank my hosts here at the table tonight uh, for a very enjoyable, lively uh, dinner. And thank Henrietta in particular for the introduction. Uh, if you've been in politics as long as I have, you, are, you find yourself introduced by lots of people and many of them don't know you even half as well as Henrietta now knows me. And sometimes this leads to unusual moments. In 1993 and 94, I was running for the US Senate in Michigan. And I didn't really have that strong of a resume. So my staff, as you know how these things are, uh, decided to beef things up by putting enormous amounts of detail into a biography, which we would send out wherever I spoke. And to give you a feel for it, it was like about a five-page, single-spaced introduction. <laughs> the first two pages just got me through kindergarten, so it gave you a feel <laughs> of how, how much detail they went into. But it, long story short is that the, the first two or three times I went out and spoke, the person introducing me had never met me before and would feel compelled to read this lengthy, self-congratulatory sort of thing that had been sent to them that day by fax in the old days where fax machines were the the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the technology. In any event, after about two or three of these painfully embarrassing introductions, I went back to my staff and said, you know, look, why don't you call the person, tell them you're gonna fax them this information, but tell them not to read the whole thing. I mean, it's embarrassing, it's long, and it's pretty trivial. And so that night, sure enough, I was in some small city in Michigan, and I was being introduced at a Rotary Club by a person I'd never met. And I saw him pull out the, you know, the five-page thing, and I thought, oh, God, you know, here comes another one of these embarrassments. The guy got up and said, well, you know, he said, I was planning to read this biography that Mr. Abraham's office sent me a couple of days ago. He said, but his staff called this afternoon and said that in introducing him, the less said about him, the better. So <laughs> here's, here's Spence Abraham. Now, so politics is an interesting profession. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I have to say, I, it didn't, I, I didn't click exactly that this still was part of Parents Weekend. And when I saw the crowd tonight, I thought, my, this is one of the oldest student bodies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but, um, but now I realize, of course, that like me, all of you who are here as parents are uh, part of the CMC family. And we have a son who's a freshman 
uh, that just started this fall, Spencer, and uh, on behalf of my wife Jane, who's here, we just want to say thank you uh, to the whole CMC community, and I'm sure the other parents probably feel the same way. We really <clears throat> have felt remarkably well received here and welcomed here and already feel very much a part of it. And Priya, I want to thank you in particular for having invited me, but also for you know, really opening the, 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 the doors here of CMC to our family, and we are grateful for that. Uh, it's a little daunting to uh, speak uh, when your own son is in the audience, and uh, this, <laughs> this afternoon there was a baseball game. My son is part of a group of baseball players that just arrived. I was kind of pulling for the game to go into ma many, many extra innings so that uh, I wouldn't step over some unknown line into embarrassment, so I'll do my best to... Uh, to stay on track, but um, what I do want to talk about tonight, is, as Henrietta said, is talk a little bit about energy. And <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I think really is a dramatic change in terms of public policy uh, in the United States is, is to just look back from the time when I uh, served as Energy Secretary to today and how much more significantly uh, energy issues and the decisions that relate to energy have, have become uh, over a relatively short period of time. And so what I'd like to do tonight is to talk about the sort of some, what I now would, I guess, have to term ancient history, <clears throat> which would be, you know, what was going on when I left office, the developments uh, that have transpired in the world of energy since that have changed things so significantly, uh, the challenges or some of the challenges at least, that we face not only as a country but as a global community today. And then maybe some, some thoughts about the future. And then I know we have Q&A afterwards, so I'll try to stay within the, the time frame. Uh, the history is, is interesting. I stepped down as secretary approximately 11 years ago. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, we believed really that energy uh, and energy markets were largely predictable and that you could pretty much forecast uh, the future, that it wasn't that complicated. Uh, here were the things we, we thought. We thought that the United States' dependence on imported oil would continue as far as the eye could see. It was already at that time nearing 60 percent, and we expected uh, that that percentage would continue to grow so that by today or by 2020, for example, uh, it might be 70 percent or higher and that that would put America at a great disadvantage in terms of our, our, our need to import energy <clears throat> from relatively unstable parts of the world. Uh, we knew that the demand for natural gas was growing because more people were moving to natural gas power generation, and as a result, uh, the domestic reserves we had did not appear as if they would be sufficient to meet this growing demand. So we. We forecast when I about the time I left office that, that by 2020 we would start to have to import natural gas as we had been importing oil. Not at the same levels initially, but as, as a matter of long-term uh, challenge uh, that we would be growing dependent on gas imports as well. Uh, we believe that coal <clears throat> was not only the current dominant uh, source of U.S. power production, but that that dominance would continue. And notwithstanding concerns about emissions, uh, it appeared as if coal would remain king for uh, decades to come, with projections that uh, exceeded 50 percent in terms of how much of our power supply would be uh, the result of coal-fired power generation uh, long into the future. And so the focus was on whether or not we could develop technologies uh, that could produce clean coal uh, and carbon sequestration for uh, the separated carbon we hope clean coal uh, processes could, uh, could produce. Nuclear energy was in decline uh, due to the fact that many of the anti-nuclear groups had been making an increasingly effective case about the safety of nuclear power plants. Uh, renewable energy was making some progress 11 years ago. It was starting to become a a relevant source of power, although a tiny source, but nonetheless it was making progress and we hoped and, and believed it would, it would continue. And on the international scene there were a lot of very significant things going on as well. Uh, Russia was trying to straighten out its economy after the fall of the Soviet Union. It was still having challenges. It was trying to sort out its, its energy marketplace as well. 
that was looking to the United States and to the West to help them to do that. Uh, and on, frequent, on a frequent basis, the, both the energy ministers and the finance ministers of Russia would come to the United States, meet with me and meet with colleagues of mine in the cabinet to ask how America could, could help stimulate more foreign investment in the Russian energy sector. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the Russians and the Americans back 11 years ago were becoming suspicious about the plans of Iran, worried about the fact that in Iran, uh, Russia's program to build a nuclear reactor were being diverted by the efforts, <clears throat> then very early stage efforts, of the government of Iran uh, to develop its own independent source of fuel for those reactors. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia was America's most dependable friend in the energy world. Uh, back in those days, and this gives you a real sense of how much things have changed, one of the top foreign policy priorities of the United States was that the OPEC countries would set production levels at, at a point where the price of oil, the band as we used to call it, uh, for oil prices would never exceed $28 a barrel. We viewed our economy as being jeopardized if the price of oil ever went higher than that for a continuing period of time. And we'll get back to where that, of course, equation is today. And the Saudis were a uh, supporter and friend during that effort and during those discussions, always working within OPEC to try to keep production at a target level that produced prices in roughly the range that, that we, the United States, desired. And then I left office, <clears throat> and over the 11 years since, a lot of cha changes have occurred. Uh, and it continues to be a world of change uh, still today. First, new technologies, primarily hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, have opened up dramatic amounts of new reserves of oil and natural gas for the United States. Uh, basically changing this country from a country that was dependent on imports and looked like it would be increasingly dependent to a country that now uh, has, has moved over across the line and, and moved into being a producer-exporter country, uh, as we will discuss in a moment. There's, of course, been during this period a much enhanced focus on the implications of emissions of greenhouse gases as part of the activities that, that go into the production and use of energy. Uh, at that, during that period, as, as that concern has arisen, uh, climate activists who just 11 or so years ago were uh, strongly opposed in many cases to the development of nuclear energy have come to realize that nuclear power plants are the one large scale uh, baseload uh, source of carbon emission free production in the world. And so there's a shifting of sentiments with respect to nuclear energy as a result. But none the, nonetheless, like other forms of energy, nuclear power, uh, as well as coal and others, are being essentially pushed to the sidelines because of the dramatic drop in the price of natural gas. And so because natural gas prices are at essentially historic lows, uh, we have a situation now where it is almost impossible to justify building new nuclear power plants uh, or other types of power generation in the United States. And, in a growing sense elsewhere in the world as well. Meanwhile, the United States economy and the economies of a lot of countries, including developing countries uh, and countries in West Africa, for example, are increasingly dependent on not low, but rather high prices for oil as the production and export of oil in those countries is growing. Uh, meanwhile, as I mentioned or alluded to before, we've seen a shift with respect to the use of coal where we believed 11 years ago that coal would remain at least half of our power source in the United States as far as we could see, uh, today it isn't, and it's declining rapidly. Partly because, as I've said, we've got low natural gas prices, and if you're a power company and you need to build a new facility, uh, there's absolutely no question that a natural gas power plant is cheaper and will run cheaper uh, than a, than a coal-fired power plant or a nuclear plant or any of the other options available. And with this abundant growth in U.S. power production, U.S. Uh, 
oil and gas production, uh, we've seen a lot of changes in terms of America's view of energy. Uh, where, as I said before, we thought uh, oil above $28 a barrel uh, posed a dramatic threat to the American economy. <laughs> Today we say $28 oil, it's killing us, it's hurting us. Uh, in just a few years have gone by. And so today, instead of worrying about maintaining all of our domestic production for our own use, in December, the Congress of the United States passed and the President signed into law a bill that would lift a long time ban on exporting crude oil from the United States so that now the United States can join the world uh, exporters on the other side of the equation, using the export of oil as a means of addressing a lot of our domestic economic challenges. And at the same time, we see the same thing happening with natural gas. Uh, natural gas exports uh, are now being approved. Uh, LNG, as it's called, liquefied natural gas facilities are being built. Uh, in just a few short weeks, the, the biggest and first of these is about to begin shipping out large quantities of natural gas to the rest of the world, which will not only help America's economy as we, as we export and sell this, but also uh, it will help in terms of the geopolitical strategies uh, that many of the, of the policymakers uh, see for the future. As you know, for a long time, there have only been a small number of countries capable of exporting natural gas. One of them, Iran. One of them, Russia. And as I'll discuss a little bit more in detail here, uh, we've seen natural gas exports used as a political tool because there were so few sources that gas-deprived countries could look to as a way to obtain gas. If the United States can now export gas, we can redress that imbalance and play a much more active role in helping our friends around the world who have been uh, at the mercy of those limited number of gas exporters. And other things have happened as well. Uh, the relationship between the U.S. and both Iran and, and, and Saudi Arabia have shifted somewhat. Uh, not completely shifted, but changed, uh, certainly over the last 11 years, where I don't think anybody would have anticipated uh, the Iran nuclear deal, the lifting of sanctions, the opening up for Iran of an opportunity to now strengthen its economy through exports, uh, we've done those things. And Iran is about to begin uh, very significantly entering the commercial world as, a, as an exporter of natural gas and oil once again. And meanwhile, the relationship between the U.S. and, and the Saudis has changed. Uh, where, as I said, 11 years ago, Saudi Arabia stood firmly with America on a variety of issues from the price of oil to supplying the, a market that was depleted of oil during the Iraq war with extra supply to try to keep prices stabilized to a country who today is essentially producing huge quantities of oil and exporting it and forcing down the price, at least recognizing, if not intending, but definitely recognizing that it would have a very negative impact on the U.S. economy as the U.S. energy companies that were enjoying the benefits of high prices no longer are selling into a market of high prices today. And finally, uh, as I alluded to before, over the last 11 years, we've seen Russia go from a nation who was depending on and looking for outside assistance to build its energy sector to a country that has strengthened its energy sector, that's producing huge quantities of oil and natural gas, and which has exhibited, of course, expansionist instincts in terms of how it utilizes those resources, not just in its immediate neighborhood, but with very significant implications all the way down the pipelines uh, into which it pours its commodities. And so that brings me kind of to the thesis uh, of my remarks here tonight. Uh, which is this, and that is that energy is literally at the center of almost all of the most challenging geopolitical matters and for the United States, domestic political matters and economic matters uh, in the world today. Now, had I known that when I left office, I might have stuck around you know, a little longer because it's pretty exciting to be in the epicenter of all of these different things. 
Uh, but as, a, as now a private sector consultant in this area, I am struck almost on a weekly, if not a daily basis, by the role that energy is going to play, is already playing, in terms of uh, the geopolitics of our century. And, and so let me talk about just a few of those very significant roles that energy is playing. Uh, first, uh, energy will determine the direction of economic growth uh, in key parts of the world, starting here in the United States, but in many other important countries around the planet. Uh, second, it is a key part of the struggle between uh, the Shia and the Sunni clash uh, in the Muslim world, with Iran and the Saudis, of course, representing the two sides of that debate, but a lot of other countries and peoples affected by it as well. Uh, third, it is uh, a key part of the battle between ISIS and moderate uh, governments who are energy producing economies in the Middle East and North Africa. And I believe that will become a growing uh, energy equation uh, going forward. Uh, it is critical to the survival of the ruling classes and the moderate, I think, uh, factions who uh, uh, prevail in countries that have been traditionally close to the United States who are energy producers, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to the United Arab Emirates, to Kuwait, to Qatar, and others as well. Uh, it is key to the prospect for developing countries, such as Brazil and Colombia and Mexico, who are now, I think, approaching a period when they can see really significant improvements in the quality of life and the standards of living for large numbers of their populations if they're allowed to, to, to really develop their energy sectors in a fashion that uh, provides them with the opportunity to, to trade and to, com, to, to engage in commerce uh, with their energy resources. These are energy rich countries <clears throat> and energy will play a very vital central role in whether or not uh, their development continues and flourishes. Uh, it's also a very central uh, component in the immediate future of countries who are on the brink of economic chaos, such as Venezuela. And while I don't know what would be the result of complete collapse in Venezuela, it can't be a positive result. I'm not an advocate of the policies of the governments there, but certainly there are millions of people in that country who could be uh, obviously devastated uh, if that government and if that country's economy falls any further than it already has. And energy is a key component in whether or not Venezuela is able to uh, prevent that kind of catastrophic outcome from taking place. Energy is also at the heart of the prospects for the underdeveloped world. Um, at this point, uh, as many of you know, we have villages throughout our planet who don't enjoy any of the kinds of luxuries that we do. They don't have electricity, they don't have clean water, they are deprived of many other things as well. And any hope those kinds of, of communities have for any type of, of opportunity is, is really directly connected to whether or not we are able, over the course of the next 10 to 20 years, to make it possible for them to have access uh, to energy and energy sources for the electrification of these underdeveloped parts of the world. And failing to accomplish that will have a very profound and I think perverse impact uh, on the quality of life for the whole planet. Uh, energy is also at the heart of the expansionist instincts in Russia. Uh, I referred earlier to the, the way it was when I left, the way it is today, uh, I don't think any observer of the politics and the, and the, and the external politics of Russia can, can doubt that, that Russia views the leverage it enjoys from having abundant energy resources as a, a, a very significant uh, tool in their toolbox uh, of international uh, activity. And so energy is absolutely central to the geopolitical strategies uh, of the leaders in the Kremlin. 
And of course, it is a, and, and where energy uh, policy develops and where the energy marketplace uh, uh, moves is central to our economy. Uh, when I left office 11 years ago, energy was one of the things that could have a minor impact uh, or maybe a slightly more than minor impact on America's economy. For the most part, what that meant was if gasoline prices could stay below a certain level, uh, America's eco economy would, would be essentially uh, stable. Uh, today, uh, all you have to do is just sort of watch the stock market, watch the business channels for an hour or two, and what you see is a constant focus on what's happening in the energy marketplace, what the price of oil is, and how that's impacting the rest of America's economy. Uh, we have become an economy that is highly dependent on the flourishing of our energy sector. And that, that, that strength in the energy sector has come about because America has gone from a country in which we wanted low energy prices to one where higher energy prices actually make an impact. And so energy will be at the center of the American economic equation for a long time to come. And of course, it's at the center of the debate, <clears throat> the debates over public policy, both here and abroad, uh, with respect to climate change, the issues that surround emissions of greenhouse gases, and how the global community should respond to those, uh, to those issues. Uh, I think that probably more than any other question right now, uh, the issue of how we, how we produce energy and how it's used is going to be a, a probably number one topic in inter any international organization's discussions uh, for the foreseeable future. So the question is, what should we be doing? And uh, in my view, there's a few things that are, that are strong directions that we need to follow. There's, you could probably find both in this room and certainly in the U.S. House or Senate, uh, at least 100 or maybe 435 different viewpoints. Uh, but there's some things that I think we could bring people together on. First, I think we need to continue to encourage the production, the use, and the export of natural gas. Uh, this is a fuel uh, that is profoundly cleaner uh, than coal or oil uh, for power production uh, purposes. It, it's roughly 50% of the admissions of those other alternatives, and America has a lot of it. And we should do what we can to encourage its development, uh, its use, not just for power production, but I think there's, there's other opportunities, whether it's in motor vehicle propulsion, uh, or it's as a, a, a feedstock for manufacturing, but natural gas is our friend, and we should do nothing to impede a growing and broader use of it as well as its export to help uh, our friends around the world who need natural gas uh, as well. Second, I think we need to uh, maintain and, if possible, add to the fleet of nuclear power plants we have here in the United States. Uh, for some time, we have not built a nuclear power plant. We have about 100 reactors that are operating in America today, a lot of them pretty old. Uh, sooner or later, it's not going to be possible to keep them online because of their age and obsolescence. Uh, we need to make sure that the component of our electricity production that nuclear represents, and by the way, that's 20 percent, that that huge percentage is at least maintained, if not expanded. Uh, nuclear power is a domestic source of energy at the end of the day, and it is an emission-free source of energy. And notwithstanding concerns that are all legitimate about its safety, it operates in the United States very safely and will continue to do so. Uh, third, we need to invest significantly in energy infrastructure as well as in security. Uh, there's a great threat to the energy grid. Ted Koppel recently wrote a book uh, called Lights Out. Uh, he sold about a million copies of the book. I wrote this, a book with the same title in 2009, sold about 2,000 copies. But, <laughs> but I'm trying to take credit for his, his having stolen my title. But uh, Ted's book is about you know, the, the risk to the US power grid uh, and, and the cyber threats uh, that are posed to it. And we have to work, I think, increasingly to focus on that threat 
as well as on the modernization of our domestic energy grid. It's a very old system. There are many choke points that are inadequately developed. And what we need to do is to put the infrastructure resources in place uh, to modernize the grid uh, and, and, and to modernize uh, the global energy infrastructure of the United States. Fourth, we need to foster energy efficiency uh, and the technologies that can help us to be more energy efficient and to export and share those technologies with others around the world. I mean, the, the one sort of simple part of the equation when you're talking about how do, how do, we, how do we get energy uh, markets into, into a little better shape is to reduce the demand side of the equation. We now have as a result of the information technology revolution, a capacity we've never had before uh, to bring about energy efficiency. And we need to do that. We need to tear in some of these information technologies. And that's starting to happen with the next uh, uh, system of, uh, of, of home metering. But there's many other applications as well. We need to also embrace an all of the above strategy. And you know, everywhere I go, I'm always asked, uh, you know, do you favor renewables, or what's your feeling on nuclear, or what's your thoughts about natural gas, and so on and so forth. And our approach, I think, in America needs to be they're all good, and they all have a place in the mix. And, and let's do what we can uh, to, to really make our energy mix very flexible so that we don't become too dependent on any one part of our energy uh, system. Uh, sixth, we need to streamline and develop a pathway forward to what I call the distributed generation, smart, consumer-driven electricity future that we have. <clears throat> a minute ago, I alluded to the fact that the, the, the innovations in information technology can allow us to be much more energy efficient than we are today, and that's true. They also can lead the way to having an intelligent grid system uh, which can not only improve efficiency, but but, but dramatically change the, the, the way we use and when we use uh, energy in our country. But beyond that, I think what we're going to see is a growing number of our population, particularly young people, who are going to want to have the same ability to control their decisions about energy that they have on almost everything else in their lives. And so just as we've moved away from a, a world in which uh, decisions regarding everything from telephones to where we, buy, uh, where we buy books to everything else has moved into a much more consumer uh, information technology approach. The same, I think, will happen with energy, with growing numbers of people wanting to decide who provides their electricity, who provides their energy, and being able to purchase it directly uh, through an information and a smart information developed system. And facilitating that, to me, is a <clears throat> another top priority we should focus on. Uh, we also need to, as, as a part of our concern about the need to maintain our nuclear fleet, is that we also need to make sure that the, the natural resources that operate our nuclear power plants remain accessible to us. One of the sort of hidden, and I think, uh, uh, sorry to say, uh, unknown fact about our nuclear power plants are that those plants primarily operate on fuel that is manufactured overseas using uranium that is, that is found and exported to the United States from Russia and Kazakhstan. Now, with 20% of our power supply dependent on imports of these kinds of very unique commodities, <clears throat> we are at great risk. The United States has these natural resources. Uh, because we've been getting them relatively inexpensively through a variety of federal programs from overseas uh, is to me not an excuse to essentially uh, curtail the development of these resources here at home. From a national security point of view, it's very important. Finally, we need to uh, aggressively pursue what I call breakthrough technologies that are not here today uh, but can be here in the not too distant future. Uh, one of those is hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Uh, when I was secretary, we launched a, a research initiative in this area. We got sort of down the road, so to speak, uh, but then the next thing we knew, plug-in hybrids started to emerge and other pretty exciting, glamorous things from uh, different uh, uh, 
uh, directions uh, with respect to motor vehicles in the United States. Hydrogen vehicles uh, can operate. Uh, hydrogen is a, is a relatively available commodity, and the only thing it emits if you burn it in a fuel cell is water vapor. Uh, from the standpoint of long-term energy efficiency, uh, from the long-term point of view of emissions, and frankly, from the long-term point of view uh, of availability, it's a very attractive alternative. Uh, another such technology is nuclear fusion. Uh, tremendous strides are being made in the development of and research on uh, fusion technology. It has the potential uh, in the lifetimes of the students at Claremont McKenna, at least, of becoming a clean energy, inexpensive form of production of energy uh, in our planet and putting more focus on technologies that can be breakthrough technologies like all of these, in my judgment, should be high on our public policy priority list. So that's kind of a quick summary of where we were, what's happened, what we face, and where we should go. Uh, but before I, I conclude and we go to questions, because I think I've got seven minutes left, I, I'd like to just uh, address some final comments here to, to the students present, <clears throat> because um, uh, this is a, I intended this to be a, a remarks uh, aimed primarily at, at, at young people who are, uh, like the students here at Claremont McKenna, looking at their future and the roles they can play, and very frequently the roles that they might be playing uh, in the world of public policy development, government, serving their countries. So let me kind of conclude a little more personally and talk about a couple of things that I hope I can convey tonight in a way that uh, is of some help uh, to you. Uh, because I know a lot of you want to be, in one way or the other, you know, playing an active role in the future of either this country or countries that you have come here from. And if you do, uh, I just will give you two lessons that I've learned <clears throat> that I think are, are probably have served me better than any others. And, and they didn't come easily. I had a in each case, uh, uh, through trial and error, uh, come to these conclusions, but I'm gonna share them with you. Uh, the first is that if you truly want to have an impact, if you truly want to get involved in and have a professional role or a very high level sort of volunteer role in shaping the policy uh, of this country or your country, uh, you must be prepared to lose and not give up. Uh, I'll tell you my story. 1974, I was a senior in college at Michigan State University. And I was very active in politics. I had become a Republican and I was uh, anxious to be involved in campaigns and to see the world of politics from the inside. And so it so happened in that election in 1974 that a very close friend of mine who was a young lawyer in our community had decided to run for what had become an open seat for US Congress. And because he didn't have a lot of resources and he didn't really have a campaign team, he was not an incumbent or anything, uh, he asked me as a, high, as a college senior to manage his congressional campaign, which I thought was like the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me. And so at age 21, and he was 31, we went out and decided we would take on the party leadership and their, effectively, their designated candidate for Congress uh, in the primary. And we worked and we worked and we worked. And on primary election night, to the, the astonishment of the Michigan political community, uh, my friend, this young lawyer, defeated the party's chosen heir apparent to this congressional seat. And we were euphoric, <clears throat> and we were highly confident we could repeat this and win the general election. And so uh, in Michigan, the primaries in August, so we worked through until November. Uh, but 1974, as some of you, not a lot of you in this room, a few of you will remember, uh, was not a great year for Republicans. Richard Nixon resigned the presidency in the middle of the fall campaign. Gerald Ford became president. Prob Republicans went up in, in public uh, esteem until Ford pardoned Nixon, <laughs> and then they went back down again. Uh, and so there we were in uh, a very tough campaign trailing the entire campaign, but every week closing the gap. And on election night, we ended up with the closest congressional race in America, but we lost by 647 votes out of almost 200,000. Now, it would have been very easy and, and at, 
for me, I almost did want to kind of give up politics and move in a different direction. I was headed off to law school, and so for a few years I thought I would pursue a career in the law. But I was always drawn back, and I didn't let losing stop me from being committed to advancing the ideas that I believed in. And so I stuck it out. And over the years, from 1974 on, I had a variety of jobs, some of which Henrietta you know, uh, mentioned earlier, and if you'd had that biography of mine from the 1994 campaign, you'd have heard all these other things too, but fundamentally I stayed involved, and I worked hard. And a lot of defeats <laughs> took place during the next 20 years. A few wins, but mostly not successful. Uh, and then in 1994 in the state of Michigan, I ran for the United States Senate in a race where I was given very little chance of winning. I had never held public office. I'd only been active in helping in campaigns. I'd done some uh, policy work in Washington, but it was, a, it was an open seat in a very uphill contest. And I was running against a multi-term congressman who had more money than I had, who had much more name recognition, and, and many other advantages, but we kept closing the gap. And we got to the last week, and uh, suddenly for the first time in the polls, I moved slightly ahead, and we had a great finish to the campaign. And in 1994, I was elected and given a chance to serve in the United States Senate. And the reason I bring this up is because the person I defeated in that race was the guy who had won the congressional seat in 1974 when I thought, you know, maybe politics wasn't for me. So you've got to be prepared to lose, but come back to fight again for the things you believe in and to never give up. And the other thing, I mentioned this at our table tonight, is that you'd really, especially I think in these times, need to go into it understanding that even though you will find people who don't share your views to be very unpleasant sometimes, uh, it is in your interest to respect and honor the people that are on the other side. Because you never know how life may treat you. In 1994, I was lucky enough to be elected to the Senate in the year 2000. Uh, I ran in a presidential year, which in Michigan is never very good for Republicans. And President Bo Bush, George W. Bush, <clears throat> ran at the top of the, the ticket that year and lost Michigan by six percentage points, and I, running for re-election, lost by one, one point, after six years in the Senate, a job I had dreamed of most of my life, and I was out of office. And I didn't quite know what I was going to do, but um, I kind of held out hope that maybe there'd be a possibility for me to serve uh, in the uh, Bush administration, and so, I did, you know, in my own very subtle way, because you can't be too overt on this, lobby for a chance to do so. And uh, on Christmas uh, Eve of 2000, I got a call from a guy named Andy Card, who'd been designated to be the chief of staff to Bush. And when I got the call, I thought I probably wasn't going to get anything because, you know, if it was good news, Bush would call, right? <laughs> it's bad news they have the other guy call. So. Uh, <laughs> But to my amazement, he, uh, he offered me the position of Secretary of Energy, and I won't go into a funny long story about how that happened, uh, but let me just say I'm the only person in the history of the United States to be, to be actually appointed to a cabinet position, which when he was in the Senate, he had, of a cabinet agency in the Senate, he had actually tried to have abolished. But <laughs> <laughs> we got through that somehow. Uh, the confirmation hearing was a bit delicate. But, um, <laughs> On the morning of the confirmation hearing, uh, I showed up to face the inquisitors, the senators who I had most recently served with on the Senate's Energy Committee. And to my surprise, I was greeted at the beginning of the, at the entry to the hearing room by the person who I had lost to in the U.S. Senate race, who said, I wanted to come over today to participate in introducing you to the committee and offering my endorsement because even though we obviously in the campaign you say a lot of things about each other uh, you never you know you never treated me disrespectfully you actually ran a you know a campaign of respect and and I want to help you now uh, to be in the cabinet and it meant a huge amount to me obviously and certainly facilitated my nomination but but 
it taught me a lesson, which is that you know, in, in, in anything you do, whatever profession you may choose, uh, it is critical that you respect other people, respect those with different views, and, and try your best to advance and advocate the things you care about uh, without uh, dishonoring those that are on the other side. And I hope that the students who are here, many of whom I know are going to look at some type of role in public policy, uh, can try to bring that to the arena when you come. Because as you all know, uh, in America today, there are a lot of people uh, who have very important jobs or want to have important jobs who uh, show virtually no respect uh, for others, uh, for those of differing views. Uh, and they want to run for the highest offices and the lowest, uh, you know, and, and, and their whole campaign is about how bad the world is and how bad the opponent is, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe some of those people will win, but we don't need so many of those people in office anymore. We need people in public jobs uh, who have who bring respect and, and, and honor uh, to the profession and to the political and public policy arena. And I hope the generation of people who are made up of students here at Claremont McKenna and your colleagues around the country uh, are able to do that. Because I think we used to have that. I don't think we have it as much anymore, and I think we need it again. And I think you all have the capacity, because I now have met a lot of people here at, at this school and certainly know some and others uh, who are those kind of people. So bring your talents and skills. Work hard. Don't be dis destroyed by defeat, but rise above it. And above all, come to the arena with respect uh, for yourselves and for the other side of the equation. And if you do, I think your contributions will be mightily effective and you are needed. So thank you for having me here. I'm glad to answer any questions, but uh, thank, uh, I want to thank the CMC community, all the other parents here tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's been great. <laughs> We now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. As always, priority will go to students. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak with us uh, this evening. Uh, my question is actually with regards to nuclear energy. Um, you noted that it has had some problems, such as public relations issues with regards to safety, concerns about proliferation, um, but that there are sort of renewed reasons to believe that uh, it's possible, such as increase, increasingly safe technology, like thorium or pebble reactor systems. The fact that it's, a, as you noted, a great base load generator to be paired with renewable energies. Um, but the one issue that I didn't sort of hear you finally come around to cover is the issue of the economics, especially um, sitting next to dirt cheap, uh, liquefied natural gas, um, or the fact that its uh, high upfront costs often make it prohibitive. Um, so I'm curious to know what kinds of specific U.S. policies you think can reduce the cost. I know that you talked about increasing the ability to mine uranium in the U.S., um, but sort of as that uh, ends up being less than about 20 percent of the overall cost, it seems. I'm wondering about sort of larger ways that we can sort of increase the technology or the development of nuclear generation. Well, th th thanks for the question. <coughs> and. Um, you know, part of the cost, one of the reasons the price of nuclear power plants keeps going up is that getting them approved has become a long, long, drawn out, complicated and difficult process because a lot of people have, for a long period of time, opposed nuclear plants no matter what the information is, no matter what the, you know, the, they just don't support it. And I think, as I alluded to in the comments, that may be changing. I think some of the people who are, are adamant about uh, climate issues have come to, I think, uh, appreciate the role that nuclear power plants are going to play in reducing emissions while creating and, and you know, the, the, the electricity generation they do. And if you could shorten the, 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 the approval process, whether in the United States or anywhere, but especially here, uh, the cost will, will you know, will fall dramatically. And all you have to do to see that is to compare uh, the costs for units that are being built in places like the UAE or in China versus what, it, what the overall costs are in America where the regulatory process, not that we want to shortcut anything, but 
but just the fact that at every step of the way, people are opposing and going to court and so on, often just because they oppose nuclear. And I think if there is a greater appreciation of the, con the contribution that nuclear energy can play, uh, we'll start to see some of that, that kind of what I would call legal and regulatory cost reduced, not because we're making it too easy to build one, but just because you can, you can condense that, that process more if there isn't uh, you know, people that are from day one fighting just for the sake of opposing. Uh, so I think that's a big part of it. I also think that if we can, if we can stand up some new generation reactors, uh, that those blueprints and approaches, those, the technologies involved, can then be you know, repeated with lower costs in subsequent plants. And then as you said, there are some, there's some exciting you know, sort of on the horizon technologies that we're still experimenting with that might you know, result in smaller or plant plants or plants using other sources of uh, uh, materials uh, that would be also less expensive. Hi, thank you so much, thank you so much for, for coming to speak tonight. Uh, I want to ask about the role of subsidies in uh, incentivizing the production of energy, which goes back to the question that was asked earlier. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the what I believe is called the Giga Factory in Nevada that Tesla is currently constructing. Uh, if, I if I recall correctly, uh, the state of Nevada granted Tesla over like a billion dollars in subsidies for the creation of the factory. And I'm wondering where you sound this issue. And at one point, essentially, the subsidies outweigh the benefits. And where, like, where that balance lies. Thank you. Which plant? I'm sorry. The, it's 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 a battery factory in Nevada. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I'm not a huge advocate of of you know subsidies for the sake of of subsidies. I think that um, that we need to take you know we need to let the markets work. Uh, at the same time, you know one of the um, one of the challenges we've had with standing up some of the new technologies. Uh, is creating an environment in which sufficient capital can be invested in those technologies uh, to, to make them viable. And one of the challenges has been that Congress, instead of, instead, if they're going to provide subsidies, then there, there should be a sufficient duration that it allows the technology to mature enough so that it, it can subsi subsist on its own. Uh, what Congress has done instead is to, is to provide like annualized sort of extensions of these subsidies so that the, that the you know, the, whatever it is, if it's a, whether it's solar or it's wind or it's something else, batteries, you know, they, they, they don't have enough time to, to develop the technology enough to be able to go to the, to the, to the capital markets uh, and, and attract. Uh, so if we're going to do it, then we need to do it a better way. But my tendency, you know, is to is to limit you know, government uh, dollars uh, prim or to primarily focus them on some of these things like nuclear fusion where I think uh, we're talking about something that's farther out that really does require you know, a variety of sources of support. And I think those are areas where we would be better served with uh, federal uh, tax dollar support. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Uh, concerning nuclear energy again, you spoke about the markets and the prices and the regulation, but really the big elephant in the room when it comes to nuclear energy is the severely overburdened and very dangerous uh, nuclear waste storage situation in the United States. So unless, unless that's resolved, I mean, I think we'd be, the U.S. would be compromising itself if they expand the nuclear um, uh, production. So um, what's your opinion on the U.S. waste storage uh, capacity at, at this point in time? Thank you. Well, thanks to the question, we actually had it at our table here earlier, so I'm all ready to answer it. Um, you know, I, uh, I was the uh, secretary who, to whom it fell the responsibility of either approving moving forward with uh, Yucca Mountain, the underground nuclear waste uh, repository in Nevada, or stopping the project. I, I studied everything I could study and, and brought in people to, to explain the scientific terms I couldn't understand, uh, and concluded that, that that could have been and can still be built successfully and safely and operated safely, and I believe that an underground storage facility uh, is a viable pathway forward. I also believe that a viable pathway forward is for us to uh, do what is already being done in a lot of other parts of the world, such as France, uh, and that is to reprocess, uh, recycle, the nuclear waste and create 
fuel from it with very, very little uh, unused material at the end of the process. Uh, back in the 1970s, the United States decided we wouldn't do reprocessing. And the reason we decided that as a public policy matter was concerns about the fact that when you do recycle, there are, are small amounts of dangerous materials, of uh, plutonium materials, for example, uh, that, that are a byproduct of that process, okay? Uh, we believed we could successfully protect that process in the United States because of our security capabilities, but we were worried that if the United States started reprocessing, other countries in the world would also do so, and they would be countries that were less capable than us of protecting this nuclear material. And so we said, we're not going to do it. And then what happened? Well, nobody followed the United States into this, you know, marathon, multi-decade underground waste approach. Instead, what most people did uh, was to reprocess. And so France reprocesses, and so do a number of the other major nuclear power uh, countries. Uh, and, if, and just to give you a sense, I, I visited the facility in La Hague, France, which um, uh, is where this reprocessing happens and where the fuel that's then reusable called mixed oxide or MOX fuel is created. And all of the nuclear waste from the entire history of France's nuclear power plant program, and they get, by the way, 70% of their fuel or of their power from nuclear, all of the unusable material is stored in an underground room, maybe three times the size of the room we're in here tonight in casks because that's all, that's, that, I and mean, that's after decades of using it. That's the only amount that can't be reused and turned into fuel uh, again. So I think that's the direction that probably makes the most sense. It, it is always met with opposition, but the opposition in my view is kind of dated, uh, or at least the rationale for the opposition because what we've seen is the rest of the world moving in that direction and the United States sitting here, think about this, with all of our nuclear waste being con stored right now in casks outside of the power plants that we have. And so if you live in the New York area and you're familiar with Indian Point, nuclear uh, facilities up there, <laughs> the waste is right there. So if somebody wants to do some damage with nuclear waste, they don't have to go out to the middle of Death Valley in Nevada and find a way to break through a hugely armed facility to get underground a thousand feet to find it, all they have to do is drive just north of New York City or just south of Detroit or just outside of Chicago where nuclear waste is being stored, has been stored for decades and all of us who pay rates uh, to utility companies who have nuclear plants have been paying a tax the federal government's been collecting uh, to build this repository, but of course hasn't done so because of opposition to it. Uh, so I think uh, either Yucca Mountain or reprocessing is the way to go. And speaking of going, it appears <laughs> that uh, we're down to the last questions here. So, Thank you so much for coming to speak. Um, I just have a short question. Uh, what were the geopolitical implications of Aramco becoming an uh, or having an IPO be Saudi Aramco? Um, well, <laughs> I, I would say this. First of all, um, the, I, I'm not, I'm not going to try to overthink this, but I would say that, that right now um, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of cross-political pressures, I think, that have resulted from the low price of oil. Uh, as I think most of everybody in this room's probably read, uh, the revenues for uh, uh, Saudis and all the other countries that uh, have national oil companies that sell oil are dramatically reduced. And in Saudi Arabia, that's, even though their currency reserves were much greater than everybody else's, it's still being felt. And uh, you have a very large population of young people there who kind of want to know where the future is going to be for them, what's going to happen. And in a low price oil environment, if that's going to be the future, uh, it creates a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Um, so I think what you're seeing are trial balloons uh, being uh, uh, sent up by the, you know, the heir appearance uh, to the leadership there uh, that, are, that are suggesting some modernized approaches to how they might uh, deal with the economy of their future. 
one might be to, to privatize some part of, I don't think you would see the whole company privatized, but to, to perhaps privatize some of the uh, assets of, of Aramco. I don't know if that'll happen, but I think what you're seeing uh, is a growing realization that, that younger people in the country want to see a game plan for the future that provides opportunities for them. And I think uh, how they would finance that future as a country might be to move more into the commercial kind of direction that, that, that would include privatization. Whether that'll happen or not, I don't know. Uh, hi, thank you for speaking. Uh, I wanted to get your uh, stance on whether you think it would be a good idea for the U.S. to uh, implement a carbon tax to address climate change, and why or why not you don't think it's a good idea? Well, I'm not a big tax guy, so as you could have guessed, probably, but, but I think that, first of all, there's the question of whether or not that's realistic. Uh, the one thing I, I think people in uh, the decision-making jobs of Congress, uh, uh, or even at the White House are, are going to be, you know, uh, very hesitant to do is to ever uh, directly place a tax that would increase the cost of fuel at the pump or heat in the house or other things that relate to people's, uh, you know, happiness. So carbon tax is going to be a hard sell for the voters and for the elected officials who would have to put it in place. And I don't think you need it to accomplish the goals that are being talked about in terms of emission reductions. I think through the use of new technologies, the greater use of natural gas, as I outlined here tonight, the greater, you know, a, a maintenance and perhaps expansion of the nuclear fleet, uh, the growing role that renewables are playing in terms of our power generation, I think all of these together are going to have a very, you know, positive uh, impact on, on emissions, and you're already seeing it. Uh, you're also seeing it with regard to fuel efficiency. I mean, when, when I, I, you know, I kept talking about when I left office, you know, which is, you know, a long time ago, but, but back then when we sampled public opinion on things like uh, electric vehicles or rooftop solar, uh, public, the public had no interest in this. They, 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 were, they, they didn't like the way that it looked. They didn't like uh, the range of the cars. They didn't like any of this. And now here we are just a decade later with people embracing uh, in ever larger numbers uh, on their own, with their own free choice, uh, rooftop solar panels or electric or, or, or hybrid vehicles. So I think, you know, I think a lot of this happens, you know, by, by having a kind of market where you have, you know, people trying to, 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 to utilize their uh, their ingenuity and skill to provide techno technological uh, answers to the problem. And I think a technology-driven model is invariably more attractive and likelier to succeed than a regulatory-driven model, uh, whether it's on uh, the issue of carbon emissions or other uh, public policy objectives. Um, forgive me if this question is sort of better directed to the Department of the Treasury than uh, to you, but I was wondering how, um, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> given, given the significant volatility in oil prices, uh, how do you weigh sort of either the geopolitical or economic pros and cons of having the international oil market be priced in U.S. dollars? Well, you've asked a question beyond my depth, uh, so I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, what I do think is this, that... Um, the oil market is not a free market, okay? And so regardless of the currency that might be used, uh, as long as you have the kind of political overtones and political agendas that play a role in it, uh, the currency's much less relevant. Um, Right now what we have, what we've had for over a year, is a market in which, I believe at least, uh, that Saudi Arabia uh, has decided uh, <laughs> that the market, and correctly so, the market's oversupplied. Uh, demand in Asia, in Europe has not been what it was. In Europe it's been pretty flat for a long time. In Asia, you know, the dramatic growth is still substantial growth, but it's still less growth. So recognizing there was an oversupplied market, uh, the Saudis have done something very different than what they did back when I referenced uh, their behavior in, in the early part of the century. Uh, back then, they said, okay, what we're going to do is uh, 
we're going to essentially build a, a floor under this market by cutting back production in OPEC so that the market's no longer oversupplied. And they were willing to do that, in my view, because if they lost market share, which because they were the ones who would cut back, uh, that market share would shift to other members of uh, the cartel. Uh, today, that isn't the case because of the significant amount of, of production going on in America, but especially, I think, in Russia. And I believe the Saudis' view has been that they're not going to give up market share so that non-OPEC countries uh, can, 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 can capture that share away from them. Instead, what they believe is that low prices will force the U.S. and force Russia uh, to reduce production because, and it's happening in the United States, the capital expenditures of most, all of the energy companies, at least in the oil and gas sector, uh, is dramatically down. The amount of rig counts is down. The amount of production is coming down. And that's what I think the Saudis wanted to do. But I don't think the currency is the big factor. I think the, you know, it's the individual strategies of the players. And that, that's become much more complicated with the growth in production and capability uh, both in America and in, and in Russia. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, do you think that radical or destabilizing elements within Saudi society could potentially change the country's oil output capabilities? Well, I think I alluded earlier to the fact that, that one of the real, you know, significant geopolitical issues before us is uh, the actions of ISIS or of other radicalized groups uh, in uh, the Middle East and North Africa in these producing countries. Um, uh, the motivation to destabilize governments is obvious. Uh, the pathway to do it is obvious. So I think it's certainly a threat. And I'm, I think we all know that those countries are doing a lot to try to prevent it. I think that they seem to have the capability uh, of, of, at this time, of dealing with the threat of radical terrorist organizations. Uh, the bigger challenge is the one that was related to the earlier question, which is if, if, if the populace in the countries, not the radicals or the terrorists or whoever, but, it, but if, if the, the average young person in a country sees no hope in, in their future, you know, what do they think and where do they want to go? And we've seen in Egypt, for example, an example, you know, one, one reference to that. Uh, but countries that, that are so dependent on uh, production and, and sale of, of of one commodity or two commodities, you know, are very much, you know, threatened if they don't have, I think, a, a far-sighted approach as to how the next generation of, of adults in their country can enjoy a lifestyle that will be to them uh, fulfilling and, and rewarding. If they fail to do that, then I think that's where the risk, in my opinion, is. I don't think the risk is so much of being able to deal with the immediate threat. It's the longer term social threat, and, and I think that's consequential. Hi. Thank you, for, first of all, for serving for the country. This is very inspirational. Um, you indicated that the United States is, uh, no, is moving to becoming uh, no longer an energy importer. Um, in fact, um, we've gone from importing 11 million barrels of oil a day to importing 9 million barrels of oil a day it's still not energy independent. So unless we can use our natural gas resources to uh, uh, drive transportation, we are effectively never going to be energy independent. Um, I, said, I said that in my book um, not too long ago, the, the one that didn't sell. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought then I could make that statement without any doubt. I am not sure that we can't uh, reduce that, that dependence a lot more in the right price environment. Um, the fact that we've lifted the crude oil export ban is an indication of where the trend is, is headed. The one thing that I think, and maybe that we can't get to that point or sustain it for a long period, but where I do think um, uh, the potential is uh, 
is in, a, in the North American continent. And I think if you, if you took the cumulative potential of Canada, Mexico, and the United States, you're talking about the potential, if you wanted it, to, to keep the resources within the continent and meet the demands within the continent. Now, I'm not sure you want to do that because it's a disruptive kind of impact on, on, on free markets, but I'm just saying I think you could be there uh, in the not too distant future. Um, it depends on a lot of things. Does Mexico seriously move forward in terms of allowing external investment in its energy sector? And if so, at what levels? And is it successful? And so on. Does Canada, you know, continue to uh, uh, to allow its energy sector to expand? Uh, but I think within the continent, it's it's definitely uh, you know not uh, beyond reach. And, and within the United States, it just sort of depends on on price as to how much more you know uh, growth will be. But there's definitely more potential in terms of reserves. So we'll see. This will be our last question this evening. Hi, thanks again for uh, coming to talk to us tonight. So you had a really interesting comment earlier um, about the potential for future technologies that will let people um, sort of determine and choose where their energy is coming from, have more control over that. Another thing I'm thinking of um, is the ability for some people who generate their own energy via solar or however else to store up that energy and sell it back to the grid, um, which is allowed in some states, but not others. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious what kind of um, policy changes you think would be necessary for this kind of technology to become commonplace, um, or is this something that can happen as it exists right now? Well, on the, on the grid, I, I, I support uh, net metering uh, and wrote about this before many people wanted to have solar panels and thought it made sense then, think it makes sense now. Obviously, you know, there's a, the, the, another side of that equation is the, you know, the reaction of the utility companies at the prospect of losing, you know, a certain amount of their revenue sources. But I think, uh, I think that's part, that is part of how you move in the direction that I think a lot of people want to move. And I think we should facilitate that through uh, deregulation, not, you know, expanded regulation in, in, in the power sector. And I think that, you know, through the employment of technologies and the information technology side that allow for more individualized uh, decision making, more uh, uh, potential for distributed uh, generation, that, that that will happen. It may not happen quickly because uh, you have an awful lot of existing regulatory impediments that stand in the way, but I think it's where the demand is going to go, and I think that ultimately the policies will follow that demand. That's it. That's all the time we have for questions tonight. Please join me in thanking our speaker.